Good morning, party people, and welcome to office hours in my dining room. Uh, when Eve and I bought this house, we didn't really have a use for a formal dining room. And it just so happened that the front door lines up perfectly with the dining room. It's big French doors, so we just drive a car in the house, different car depending on the seasons. This is my 1956 Porsche Speedster replica, built on a Volkswagen chassis. It's got a 2.1 liter Volkswagen engine, uh, is ridiculously fast, easily does 90, 100 miles an hour on uh, highways, just tons of fun. Uh, it's a smile machine. We originally, the original color is that ivory there, but we wrapped it in pink for the Barbie movie, and it just really pops during the day. Uh, it's winter now in Las Vegas, uh, so it's really too cold to drive this thing out and around. Uh, so we put this one in the house. We swap a different car in and out of the house uh, during the winter months. Uh, so let's see, the top voted question from My Tea Got Cold is, have you ever had a client turn off RCSI? Um, the, the way I'm going to ask your question a couple of different ways. Have I ever told a client to turn off RCSI? No. Have I ever had a client turn off RCSI on their own and then things got worse? Yes. So that's really about it there. Uh, next up, sports fan asks, my company uses VMware for on-premises production servers. Our current wait time for new VMs is about one month. Good Lord. Uh, he asks, how are enterprise companies deploying new SQL Server VMs? Are they using Docker, Images, VMware? Uh, typically, the ones that I run into, I don't do a lot of consulting for large enterprises because generally, large enterprises want to call large enterprise consulting firms. They don't usually want to deal with small firms like me. Uh, but from what I've heard and from what I've seen, just kind of, and it may not be anywhere near common, but is that they use images, uh, templates, so that they can rapidly deploy a, a template with their standard config setup, rename the template, you know, sysprep it, that kind of thing. Uh, next up, Blue Falcon asks, should new SQL tables always be built with compression enabled? No. What's the problem that you're trying to solve? One of the things, and I, you hear me ask that question a lot, but part of that is because every time you choose a non-default option, there are ramifications that you may not be prepared for. So rather than pushing all of the buttons, I would ask, what's the problem that you need to solve? Then let's go choose the right tools for it. In the example of compression, the data is stored compressed on the 8K page, which means that every time you read it, you're taking a CPU hit to decompress that data. Now, it may not be a large CPU hit, but if your SQL Server is facing CPU problems, why would you add to that misery? So, there you go. I'm not saying compression's bad. I just go, you know, it's like, are screwdrivers bad? No, but do you need a screwdriver? Let's look at what problem you're trying to solve. Next up, Sierra asks, have you ever had a client make you take their security courses like spam email, don't click on links you don't know, how to spot generative AI, etc.? says, I hate them, but I bill clients five times the time it takes to complete them. Uh, if you make me go hell through hell, at least I'm getting paid. Um, no, I don't think I've ever had a client require me to go through that. Um, but then again, I also, I don't get remote access to anybody's servers. I don't get VPN accounts. I don't want domain accounts, none of that. Uh, when it's time for us to work together, we're going to share a desktop so that your team can watch as we go through and do things together, ask questions, because I want your input on things as I, as I work too as well. Um, so I have kind of a weird job there in terms of uh, consulting. Uh, next up, Data Guy asks, you work for a large company and are doing all greenfield development on brand new isolated SQL clusters. What are you doing to put, down your, put your foot down with developers in order to promote scalability? Are you requiring no order buys, no triggers, no long running queries? Well, you said that you're in a large company doing development with a team of developers and it's a brand new greenfield app. 
I have never seen a large company that hires developers that don't have some level of experience. In a large company, generally, there are coding standards. There is a, a set level of experience that people have. It's fairly rare that you hire people with no experience, a whole team of them, to build a greenfield application. Because after all, doesn't that sound like a nightmare? People who don't know what they're doing, working for a large company, building a brand new app from scratch, that's a recipe for performance problems. I would much rather let those, when I'm working with a team of experienced developers like that, let them do what they're used to and they're comfortable with. And as we're going through doing code reviews and things are starting to go live, I'll give them some guidelines on, hey, let's tweak this or let's change that. A couple things that I would say, though, I'd say no scalar functions and no multi-statement table valued functions. If I see either of those getting checked in, I'm concerned that we have a problem. Uh, next up, DavDBA says, my, Brent's my, my, Brent, my app's not parameterizing queries, leading to duplicate plans in the cache and uh, forced parameterization problems due to sniffing. If I fix some queries to use parameters, will it cut down the duplicates or will other parameter unparameterized queries still clog the plan cache? You really got to fix almost all of them. Just fixing some of them isn't going to fix the problem. I'll give you a classic example. I had a client who properly parameterized all their queries, but then they installed a third-party app to do backups, and that thing wasn't parameterizing its queries, and it very quickly led to rolling through the plan cache. So even just a few poorly behaved uh, queries, as long as they get called frequently, are going to cause you problems. Uh, next up, JC says, Hey Brent, what are your thoughts about hosting an enterprise SQL Server environment on Citrix Zen Server as the VM hypervisor host? I couldn't care less. Uh, to me, it's like asking about uh, uh, what brand of hardware you use, like Dell or Lenovo or Cisco or whatever. I couldn't care less because I can't really fight that fight. As a database person, if someone wants to use a particular tool, you know, go knock yourself out at the systems level. I'll deal with it the best way that I can, but usually corporate standards, you don't really want to try to fight against those as a database administrator. It sounds funny, but even like antivirus, I know some DBAs are like, you'll never put antivirus on my servers. And I'm the kind of person who's like, well, if you want to put antivirus on my servers, I just need you to know that there's going to be a performance hit for it as long as you're okay with there being a performance hit. And I may measure before and after, then it is what it is. But corporate standards are usually really hard to change. I'm, I'm a really big on the stoicism philosophy. Uh, focus on the things that you can change. Don't lose sleep over the things that you can't change. Uh, next up, Vegas DBA says, Hey Brent, I set up a distributed AG to a reporting server, and when I change a certain stored procedure from linked servers to cross database connections, the query runs forever. Um, no errors. Really, anytime I'm troubleshooting queries, I need to see the query plan. Otherwise, it's kind of like going to a mechanic and saying, Well, I got this car, and it's not working right, but you're not allowed to see it. Tell me what's wrong. The mechanic would give you about 10 seconds before he starts winding up his little spare finger there. Uh, Dino Mutt asks, how does Postgres query tuning compare with SQL Server query tuning? Um, when I teach uh, fundamentals of query tuning for SQL Server, I, I think about it as a choose your own adventure book. When SQL Server opens the choose your own adventure book, it's got different adventures it can use in order to make the query go faster. With Postgres, the book has different chapters and it's thinner. It doesn't do as many different things as SQL Server does. So when you run into performance problems, more of it is on you rewriting the query. Whereas SQL Server can make a whole lot of pigs fly, SQL Server can take a lot of pretty poorly written queries and make them work okay. Not all, obviously, but a lot more. 
Uh, Joseph asks, should backups be stored on a separate network drive rather than the SAN used for the databases in a SQL server failover cluster? What are the pros and cons of this approach? Oh, Joseph, I have the scars from this one. I, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, Mm, not quite 20 years ago, but, but uh, getting close. Uh, I worked at a company where we put our SQL Server backups on the same SAN as the production SQL Servers, because it was the only SAN that we had. Then we had a SAN firmware problem that took down the entire SAN. So we had to go to the night before's backups, which were copied off to tape. We lost like 18 hours worth of data. Now, thankfully, that firmware was done on a Saturday night, so we only lost data from Saturday during the day and like Friday middle of the night. But otherwise, the more redundancy that I can possibly get, the better off. Now, granted, not everybody can afford to put their backups on a different uh, storage device than their production SQL servers live on. Small to mid-sized businesses can't afford that, but if you can afford that, I highly recommend it. Next up, Chris says, Hi Brent, for setting max server memory, you suggest leaving 4 gigabytes or 10% free, whatever is more, for the operating system. Can you help me understand why more memory is needed for the OS as you scale up the RAM? There's something in my mouth here. For example, with 200 gigabytes of RAM, why would someone need 20 gigs for the OS instead of just 4? Chris, that's a great question, and it has to do with human nature. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've found people remote desktoping into servers. They run Management Studio, they open up backup utilities on there, they open up File Explorer, they do all kinds of stuff. And it feels like the larger that the server is, the more likely it is that somebody's doing something stupid on that server. Right about now, one of two things is happening. Either you're going, oh my God, I would never ever remote desktop into a SQL server. Or like many of the people viewing this video, you're getting a little nervous. Cause you're like, well, I don't remote in that often. And there are only 12 of us on the sysadmin team. We probably don't all try to leave desktop sessions open. I rest my case. Next up, Mustang Kirby says, I'm loading a table with 93 million rows. There's a check constraint enforced by UDF, which includes data access, so it's slow. I can disable the constraint, but then it takes forever to make it trusted again. Is there a way to directly update the is not trusted in sys check constraints? Okay, is there a way to do it? Probably you might be able to put the single server or SQL server into single user mode or go into the DAC, and you might be able to make unsupported, undocumented changes to system columns. Would I ever do that in production? Hell no. If you want to have a check constraint enforced by UDF that does data access, suck it up, buttercup. That's the price you pay. She's going to be slow. Instead, I would suggest humbly that you probably either don't need that check constraint, like it's probably not making execution plans faster, or if your only goal is to preserve data integrity, well, why would you screw around with it then? You need that to protect you if you think you really need that, where you're like, oh, I don't need it, but other people do. And don't, don't, don't get into that game. Next up, sports fan says, I just wanted to say that I'm a big fan of your training courses. Anyone on the fence should about on the fence about purchasing them should treat themselves to an early Christmas present. Thank you. I appreciate that. I should mention as a shout out that uh, the, right now our Black Friday sale is going on. If you go to brentozar.com right there on the homepage, uh, you can hit up our Black Friday sale, which runs the entire month of November. Cheapest way you'll get our classes all year long. Uh, next up, Joseph asks, is it safe to change a database's compatibility level from 2008 to 2022? Could this change improve performance or should I be cautious about issues? You should absolutely be cautious about issues. And the way that you work around those is Google for Brent Ozar, how to go live 
on SQL Server 2022. Brent Ozar, how to go live on SQL Server 2022. And I explain what to watch out for, how you set compatibility level the right way by enabling Query Store first, give you all kinds of details on there. Totally free, not even part of a training course. Uh, next up, Dopinder asks, we're currently on Azure SQL 2019 VM. What are your pros and cons about upgrading to 2022 versus waiting for 2025? So, uh, boy, you know, you hear me say this all the time, all the time. What's the problem? Oh, you're saying it along with me, aren't you? That's good, very good. What's the problem that you're trying to solve? Don't add yourself more work to fix problems you're not having. Go make a list of the... Pro Do stop looking at the release notes for 2022 or 2025. Nope, you're cheating. Put that down. Go make a list of the problems that you need to solve. Talk to your end users. Talk to your manager. Talk to your sysadmins. Make a list of the problems that you need to solve. Then focus your time on that list. SQL Server never gave anyone a raise. SQL Server never went to your boss and said, you know what, that Depender did a great job of upgrading me the other day. I think you should give Depender more money. Nope. Talk to the users, the sysadmins, your peers, and your manager. Find out what they need, because Depender, you need to make more money so you can park a car in your house. And then finally, SQL Linux asks, do you cover how to use extended events to find slower problematic queries inside your courses? Um, partially, I do during uh, the How I Use the First Responder Kit class. I believe I teach uh, how to use Eric Darling's, a couple of Eric Darling scripts inside there just as like a nice bonus because I think they're really cool. His SP Blitz Quickie Store and his SP Human Events are both great. Um, and I think I use his SP Human Events, one of the, I think I use it in uh, mastering parameter sniffing. It's been a while since I've looked at that course. Um, but is it generally the first thing that I go to? No. Is it the first thing that I go to during my consulting work? No. Uh, unless I need to troubleshoot problems with compiles uh, or blocking. Or, uh, yeah, blocking for an extended period of time. But otherwise, I, I'm not, I have a really weird job as a consultant. I have to parachute in, and I'm not allowed usually to add things that add overhead. People are at the point where they call me and are like, oh my god, things are so bad. We, we're afraid to do anything. And so I can't usually add more overhead. And really, at the end of the day, extended events adds more overhead. Um, it's not that I'm against using it. I think it's fine. It, it, when you're a long-term database administrator uh, at a particular shop, if there's a problem you need to solve with extended events that you can't solve in other ways, by all means, you should use it. Uh, and I use Eric Darling's SP Human Events from uh, time to time. Um, but is it the first place that I go for query tuning? Like you said, to find problematic queries? No, not at all, because it, it involves gathering a data. You need to plan ahead for it. You need to choose appropriately what data you're going to gather. I'd rather just use SP Blitz Cache and just go hit the ground running and immediately start making uh, progress. That's just me. I like a quick turnaround. I like to immediately get results. That's probably one of the reasons why people pay me enough money that I can put a Porsche replica in my garage, not the real thing. I would love to have a real speedster. Uh, like, you know, when I knock on this, that's fiberglass. Well, I just knocked and the dog went crazy. The dog will come. It's okay, big man. It's okay. Hey, shh. Hey, shh. shh. It's okay. It was me. Come here. Come here. It's okay. It was me. It was me. It was just me knocking on the car. There you go, big man. Hello, how you doing? How you doing? Let's say hello to the audience. Say hello. Hi. No, oh, I know you're so excited. You hey, stop, 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 stop. Uh, yeah, I was saying that I would love to uh, put a real speedster. So he's, Eve, my partner, is in China right now. And so it's just me and Beanie in the house. 
and uh, Beanie gets really excited for every opportunity that he can go play with me or go take me out. We take go outside or go for rides in the car or whatever. Uh, he's getting out way more than he usually would just because if I'm the only one here, I got to entertain him, and that's my job as a as a dog parent. Um, so we've been out around the block multiple times today. I took him on a ride. We went bye bye, um, and uh, now he's gone back upstairs and. I'm just going to go hibernate again. <laughs> uh, so that's about good for office hours. Hope you all had fun and learned something, and I'll see you all on the next one. Adios.